Good morning or afternoon for some of you. Uh, my name is Shannon Prather, Marketing Coordinator at GIS Inc. I'll be your moderator today. I'd like to thank you for joining us for today's webinar titled, What is GIOT and Why Does It Matter? It's the first in a series of six titled GIOT, Why Where Matters. I would like to take a moment to bring to everyone's attention that if you're planning on to joining us today um, or joining any additional webinars in the series, you must register for the ones that you wish to attend individually. Um, just because you're registered uh, for this episode, you will not be automatically registered for all of the webinars in the series. In today's webinar, we'll be providing an overview and definition of why is GIOT and what is it matters. Uh, we will also provide you insights of how you can benefit from IoT and how IoT can impact your business or agency. During the webinar, we'll pause for a moment to ask a polling question. We appreciate you taking a moment to answer the question as it'll help us gain a better insight into your organization's priorities. I would like to encourage you to post questions throughout the webinar. We'll not be answering individual questions during the webinar, but instead responding to all who have uh, registered with a compiled list of questions and responses um, towards the end of the webinar. After we provide some closing statements at the end of this webinar, there'll be a brief survey. The survey will show up on your screen after we have finished speaking. We realize you'll want to get back to your business at hand. However, please do not hit the close button until you've seen the survey questions appear on your screen. Your time to answer these short survey questions is greatly appreciated. Um, just a side note, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted online. You'll also receive a link to the recording uh, via email um, within a week of this webinar. As you can see on the screen, um, this is our webinar series schedule. Um, our first episode is today. That's the what is GIOT and why does it matter? Um, in August, we'll go over work smarter with sensor networks. September, GIOT asset tracking and analytics. October, indoor positioning systems and GIOT. Uh, October, um, second of a half of October, our GIOT partner ecosystem. And then in November, the future of GIOT why Wear Matters. We'll close out that series. To set the stage for why GIS is producing this Why Wear Matters webinar series, let me quickly introduce you to our company. GIS Inc. has solved wear problems geospatially for over 27 years. With over 160 professionals and one core purpose to create insight through location technology, we help state and local and federal governments, as well as commercial industries, to improve operational efficiencies, increase citizen engagement, optimize investments in the ESRI's ArcGIS platform, and increase revenues. Over the past few years, we've paired that location, geospatial GIS lens, with an IoT technology. With this GeoIoT, as we call it, businesses can attach sensors to assets to track their location in a warehouse or storeroom and view the analytics on the back end. Cities can monitor the use of space and buildings to determine whether to allocate additional resources or not. You as individuals connect smartphones to things like Nest thermostats, crockpots, and traffic routes apps to make your life easier. We'll cover these applications and many more in the series as we show you why wear matters. Without any further delay, I'm excited to welcome our presenter today, Steve Mulberry, Senior Enterprise Architect and Sales Engineer at GIS Inc. I hope you believe. Be I hope you enjoy the webinar. Hey, uh, thank you, Shannon. This is Steve Mulberry. Uh, Shannon, can you just confirm that you can hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you, Steve. Perfect. All right. So as Shannon mentioned, uh, this is the first of many uh, webinars uh, that we're excited to put on and a great a great uh, uh, set of technology that we're you know excited to, to talk about and share our experiences with you so so to make sure that that we all are on the same page this is the what is GIOT and why does it matter we're, and when I go through this presentation we're going to look at ways that we can use this technology some innovative ways of leveraging the uh, the Internet of Things and and create a, a smarter communities or smarter cities or or, or leverage or, or or understand better how we can leverage this technology uh, going forward in our industry. Uh, I'll be showing some some examples, giving you some ideas. Um, but um, I am interested as we go through this to get your thoughts and your ideas and things that you might be thinking about how you might leverage uh, this this Internet of Things within your organization. 
So with that, I always like to start off with, with this slide. This slide uh, tells me a couple things here. So there's a lot of large organizations and companies that are, that are, that are uh, investing a lot of um, research and development into this notion of connected devices. And if you look at the screen here, we have Cisco and Gartner and some other big companies that are, that are projecting by 2022 that, that anywhere from 21 to 50 billion devices will be connected uh, throughout the world. And this could range from things that we wear, like our smart watches, our Fitbits, things that we carry, like our smartphones, our tablets. Um, clothing is becoming um, um, smart or, in, or technology enabled. Uh, our, our lanyards, our badges, our homes, uh, tags, our cars, there's, there's so many different um, devices out there that fall into this category that we're truly um, uh, coming into an age where, where we live in a connected world. And uh, I've, I've done a, a similar presentation like this uh, throughout uh, uh, last year. And what always um, intrigues me is to kind of get a pulse of, of, of the community and those that uh, are listening in right now. I'd like to like to uh, get uh, get your opinion here on this connected notion. So I'm going to ask Shannon to do a, a a quick polling question at this point, and just this let's just uh, pulse the audience here. Sure, the polls open. Uh, this poll is how many connected devices do you carry? Some examples could be a smartphone, Fitbit, smartwatch. We'll just give you a few minutes. This could be anything yeah, you carry. An iPad, exactly, mm -hmm. an iPad. You know, things that you carry around with you. I'm just, we're just curious of, uh, of those uh, listening in. What, uh, what, what you may carry around with you. All right. So we'll close the poll in just a minute, and then we'll publish the results. I have to say the 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 half a dozen or so times that I've given this presentation, I've never had anybody say zero. So I'm curious to see what uh, what results you get out there. And there you go. So um, as uh, history would prove, uh, we still we we live in a connected world, right? There's nobody out there that has zero, and some of you have. Uh, more than three, which is very interesting. Um, and that could be a smart watch, a Fitbit, a phone, a tablet, but it's true and evident that we live in a connected world. And I would suspect uh, that the numbers grew, even with this attendance, um, we, would, we would see the, the same kind of spread here. So thanks, Shannon, for that. So, you know, it's interesting that we live in a connected world, but if we jump back 20 years ago, um, some folks say Kevin Ashton is the uh, sort of the founder or the father of this phrase IoT. And, and he stated literally in 1999, if we had computers that knew everything there was about things using data gathered without any help from us, we would be able to track and count everything and greatly reduce waste, loss, and cost. So that was 20 years ago. Um, and we just sort of you know, went through the notion that we, we live in a connected world. Uh, and we proved it here just with a small test group that, that this is true. So how can we use this knowledge and this understanding to greatly reduce waste, loss, and cost? How can we use this technology uh, to, to gain that, that lifestyle or that, that way of life? Uh, and this is what this presentation is going to, to kind of talk about. And what I'd like to do is kind of, kind of set the stage here um, as we go forward and, and, and give you the why. You know, why am I taking an hour of my time today and talk to you about this technology? You know, why might you be you know, spending your valuable time listening to us? And I want to share an experience we had. About five years ago, we had a assisted living facility approach us and they, they had a challenge. They had a challenge. They said, we need to keep the peace within an organization. At, at certain times, there'd be gentlemen that might get within proximity of each other. And, and sad as it, as it is, they, they, would, they would start fighting. It was almost like high school all over again. These you know, gentlemen would fight over the, over the same woman. And uh, although we kind of chuckled at the time, this was a, this was a real problem. And, and, and they wanted to find a way to solve this using technology. And so we looked at the IoT space and we thought, can we use um, these Internet of Things to help monitor 
the uh, the space within this facility. And so we built this proof of concept that allowed us to put these Bluetooth tags, uh, like wristbands, on the residents of this assisted living facility and track their movement and then set up rules that would alert the nurses that when two individuals got within proximity of each other, then alert would, would sound, the nurse would be notified and uh, she could uh, pop her head up over the desk and, uh, and keep the peace within the space. It really shed a lot of light on me uh, around this technology and how, how, this, how this could really humanize the way we interact with each other, not just in the senior care space, but in others. And, and through this exercise, we, we, we came out of this realizing that there's a lot more that we could do with this technology. We could manage the resident care schedule. We could you know, receive alerts on medication. We could report incidences. We could update patient records. We could you know, access and manage comprehensive resident profiles. We could maintain inventory. We could monitor the safety risk like we just mentioned there, you know, the wanderings off or the falling or the violence or, or track the, the, the daily living, right, me as a as a loved one of 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 someone who who um, lives in one of these facilities, I could I could I, I could log into a, a portal and look at you know the activity of my loved one. Uh, did they get out of the room? Did they get their exercise? Did a nurse visit them? Who are they interacting with? Who are their friends? You know, uh, uh, you know, give me a better peace of mind. And so this really hit home to me and made me a believer that that this that this technology can and will impact how we live our lives and how we interact with others. But it has to begin with within our communities. We have to look at, at how, we, um, how we connect these things, these devices and these objects and how we use them within the spaces that we manage. Um, there's, some, there's some terms that are flo floating out there um, on the internet and, and in uh, discussions, things like smart cities smart communities, smart airports, smart facilities, you name it, you can put smart just about in front of anything. But what I'd like to maybe introduce is that in order to achieve a, a, a smart environment, it all starts with data and the data that can be collected from these things, from these devices, these uh, objects that represent the Internet of Things. And so we, we really need a data-driven community or city or airport or facility. Um, and this is where, where I'm going to kind of approach uh, using sensor technology in this world is, is how, can we, how can we really leverage the data that we're collecting from these sensors to make a better way of life for us and for those who we serve. So it's interesting on on, on how, how we as a society um, think about this technology and, and, and what we're searching for and, and talking about over social media outlets. And so there's a company out there called IoT Analytics that produces a report every month that I, that I like to go look at. And they, they analyze you know, what people are searching on, what they're talking about, and what they're writing about in regards to the Internet of Things. And those those areas that get the most um, um, hits on uh, get 100%. And so, as as you would probably uh, guess, smart homes is is the is the, the top search talked about and write and written about topic. Specifically, things like smart thermostat and connected lights and the appliances and and your doorbells and those video cameras that can help with security. But if you look down this list, there's a couple things that that jump out to me here. One is that there's still a lot of opportunity and um, and ideas that can be shared with in other industries, right? It's from our um, agriculture all the way up the line there with retail, supply chain, connected health still, industry, smart grids, smart cities. There's still a lot of opportunity to learn and leverage this technology. But we as, as a society see the benefits of this and we're trying to in, include this within our home, why not in other places, right? We already, we already determined that we live in a connected world. How can we leverage this thing? So let's, let's kind of back up just a little bit and let's talk about the Internet of Things itself. If, if you did a quick search out on Google, you'd probably get thousands of hits on different definitions and, and ideas around this thing called Internet of Things. Um, but basically, think of it like this. It's a, it's a network of objects. These objects could be you know, devices. They could be build, uh, vehicles, buildings. It could be little tags. It could be your smartphone, 
right? It could be your um, watch, but these, these objects have enough electronics built into them in software that they can gather information through sensor technology and then pass that information down to another object. So very simply, it's an object that has enough electronics in it that can collect information and then pass that information down to another object. You know, exchange that data to something else. And, and since, you know, smart homes was the top of the list there, we definitely see this in things like the Nest thermostat or the Wheel smart plug or the Samsung smart hub, right? Some of you may use some of these devices within your home. Um, and, uh, and, and maybe already familiar with how some of these things work. So, so before I go any further in this, I'm, I'm curious to see where, where you guys sit with your understanding of the Internet of Things and how you might be, might be leveraging that right now. So let's do a, another quick poll. This will be the last polling question. I just want to kind of get a sense of where you guys sit. So, Shannon, can you kind of kick that off for us? All right, you should see it on your screen now. What's the status of your current IoT initiatives? Um, maybe you've not yet started. Maybe you need some assistance. Feel you're about average. Good, very good. And some of you may be thinking, why well, ask this question right now? I, you know, maybe some of you don't even understand what IoT is and where it can be used. And we're going to definitely talk about all of that. But I want to kind of get a sense before I dilute you with, with my understanding and my ideas. I want to kind of see where you guys sit right now. So this is important to me to understand what, the, what, what you're thinking about. Very good, and we'll give just another minute for you guys to contribute. What's the status of your current IoT initiatives? So I'm curious, Shannon, do you use any smart devices in your home? Um, I do. Um, I have a few thermostat. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Very cool. All right, we're going to close out this poll, and we will share the results. Wow, overwhelmed. Almost 50% haven't started yet, um, and some have a good understanding. So we got a good mix here, which is great. Um, and, and this is what this, this, uh, this whole webinar series is all about, to help understand and educate uh, you know, around this technology and how we can really leverage this. So, so a, a, great, a great time to ask that question. Thanks, Shannon. So let's let's move forward. So so we define this thing, this Internet of Things, as objects that have, you know, enough electronics to gather data and send them over. So think of of these things as as three types. There's things that collect information and send it. There's things that receive information and then act on it. And there's things that do both. And it's when the things that do both that's when we get to this level of where we can use the term smart. Right. When we have a smart community that's using Internet of Things, it's, it's those things that are deployed that can collect information, receive information, and then do something with it. Right. Let's take, for example, the net thermostat. Right. We're talking about smart homes. Let's take that as an example. So we have our home. We uh, purchase this net thermostat. We bring it to, the, to our home. We install it. And one of the things we have to do when we install this Internet of Things, this device, is to register that or configure it to use our Wi-Fi in our home because this is an internet of things. It has to be connected to the internet in order to use it. At the same time, I can install an application on my phone. And now the two things, these two objects can, can communicate to each other. The net, thermos, the net thermostat can, can learn my behavior in my home and how I use my home, how it's occupied and adjust my temperature based on my occupancy can send me alerts on my phone to tell me certain conditions of my of my environment. And then from my phone, I can send information back to the thermostat to recalibrate or reset the temperature. So this is a great example of our two objects, two things are communicating back and forth over the internet to react based on conditions, either environmental conditions or input from me as the user. 
and it's and it's always interesting to to see where where smartphones themselves have come over the years. And so I want to I want to kind of give you a, a sense of just how powerful our smartphones are from a from an IoT standpoint. I don't know if you realize this, but this is this is my uh, cell phone right here. It's a, a Samsung S9, and um, it has a, a lot of sensors here. We see the, the typical ones there, like battery, GPS, Wi-Fi. But if you look down the list here, from linear acceleration to gravity, magnetic, rotation, light pressure, step counter, proximity, these are all sensors that are built inside of my thing, right? My object, my my smartphone, that are constantly gathering information about how I use my phone, whether I'm playing games, whether I'm doing virtual reality, whether I'm just talking on the phone or walking, whatever. If I fall in, right, those kinds of things are being collected and can then be passed to other things to help give me a better experience while I'm using my phone. Now, I'm going to introduce a new term here. A, a, a smartphone is an object or device that uses what's called a wide area Internet of Things, a wide area IoT, meaning that in order for my information from this phone to be used, I have to connect either through cellular or Wi-Fi or some kind of communication protocol that can send that information to something else, right? So if I'm using my, um, my fitness inf uh, application on my smartphone, it collects information, sends that up to a cloud a web page that then my friends can contribute to and we can exercise together that's called wide area iot there's a term called short range iot and that's where i might have a fitbit or a smartwatch and those devices communicate over a protocol called bluetooth to my phone so we have short range iot things that communicate over different networks like Bluetooth or things like Zigbee or Z-Wave. There's other types of short range communication protocols that allow me to use things like Fitbits and smartwatches or Bluetooth tags or RFID tags that communicate to wide area devices like my phone or a Wi-Fi access point or cellular tower or those kinds of things. And it's important and it's, and it's, it's really important to understand these communication protocols as we go forward and talking about devices because then it helps me determine what I can deploy within my spaces and how I can use these, these different technologies to answer and the challenges that I may have within my, my organization. So, so where does this geo IoT term come from, right? We talked about this at the very beginning. So we understand what the Internet of Things is, and it's nice that uh, you know that I can I can lay in my bed and I can bring up my phone, and I can restart my coffee maker because I want to sleep an extra thirty minutes. That's cool, but that what 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 really gets us excited from an Internet of Things is when we attach a spatial location to that, a geographic location. So at GIS Sync, we coined the phrase Geo IoT because we see a definite connection from, from, from the geographic component to these objects to what these objects can really collect and send down the stream. And we can use that in, in, in combination to do a lot of spatial analytic functions and answer a lot of spatial questions and challenges. So Geo IoT is nothing more than, than adding that geographic or that geospatial location to a Internet of Things, a device, one of those objects. And I, and I want to show you an example of that. And I'm going to talk through this from, again, from a smart home perspective. So my son and I, we, uh, we have a, one of our chores is vacuum, vacuuming our, uh, our floors. And this last Christmas, my son and I pulled our money together and we got this thing called a Neato. This is a robotic vacuum cleaner. Now, this built into this little robotic vacuum cleaner has LiDAR sensors. It's the exact same sensor technology that's used in the Google self-driving car. It's just scaled down a lot. What I mean by that is right up here up top, I'm going to use my mouse to show this. Just this little thing right here, this is a LiDAR sensor, and it continuously spins around, sending out LiDAR signals, getting a 3D picture of its surrounding. And because of that, it can do laser for uh, floor plan mapping. It can do course correct, uh, correction and navigation. Uh, I can connect this device to my Wi-Fi. So I can connect this 
this thing that's collecting information locally to my wide area network Wi-Fi. I can control it from my phone or any phone. I can actually set this thing up to my Alexa and say, hey, Alexa, start vacuuming. I can also set up geofences that limit where this thing connects to. And so from my phone, I can control this device. Another example of an of an Internet of Things, but what gets me excited about this and that and that brings that geo IoT focus to the forefront is that these late LIDAR sensors are doing a very accurate mapping of my space. And so uh, my son and I, we call ours Vader. So I can, from my phone, I can kick off Vader and say, isn't that kind of cool? Have Vader vacuum your floor there. But Vader vacuum my floor. And as it does that, it creates this very high detailed rendering of my floor plan. So detailed that right here, these little dots are uh, the legs of the chairs on my uh, dining room table. So, so we, we, we take this concept of an Internet of Thing, one object talking to another object, we attach a geospatial location to it or the ability to capture spatial information while this thing is moving or while these IoT things are communicating with each other. And now we really have a powerful device that gives us the ability to do some high-end spatial analytics with using the Internet of Things. Um, so, so hopefully up to this point, we've kind of described what IoT is. These these objects that communicate one with another. Uh, Geo IoT, which we provide the spatial context to these Internet of Things. Um, we're definitely a connected world, and we're using this technology all over the place, predominantly in smart homes and smart facilities. So, so how did GIS Inc. get started in this whole world? Where where did where did we find our passion? Right? Where where when did we get this 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 concept and notion that we wanted to really look at this technology? We we continuously have hackathons at GIS Inc. and we always challenge our developers and analysts and those actually pretty much anybody in the company who wants to participate to stretch the limits of technology. And about six years ago, seven years ago, we asked that question, and from that. Uh, came a group of developers, about three of them, built this game called uh, Tag Your It. It was a zombies game when zombies was really big and popular back then. It may still be here a little bit now, but but from this exercise, we th those three developers um, brought um, positioning technology into a game, and not just from an outdoors perspective, but from an indoors. Can we take a game and have spatial elements to that game from an indoors perspective. And at that point, we really started getting into the Internet of Things and indoor positioning. And from that effort, we produced this indoor positioning system and analytics platform called Geometry. And we got a we got a, a an opportunity to leverage this technology in the Atlanta airport when we did a proof of concept that allowed us to track and monitor any Wi-Fi enabled device that entered inside of the main terminal and the T gates of the Atlanta airport. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been through the Atlanta airport um, or in the T gates um, recently, but they're they're actually retrofitting all their lighting to to better equip themselves for indoor positioning and analytics. But at the time, about five years ago, this was all Wi-Fi enabled. So the red dots you're seeing here on the screen are, are actual anonymously tracking Wi-Fi enabled devices. So cell phones and, and, and uh, tablets and, and, and uh, things like that. And from that information, we can store that and create heat maps and we can determine things like total visitors and unique visitors and rollovers. And, and this really opened up our eyes to how we could leverage this technology to help impact the um, experience of individuals, right? Shortly after this, we got the call from that assisted living facility, and we were able to answer the challenge that they had. So through these two exercises, we really um, grabbed hold of this technology, got a passion for, for, for this technology and how we can actually use it to better our experiences and, and our way of lives here. At this time, we we started looking at other use cases. You know, where else can we use this? We had a we had a, a, a really nice use case in the health and human services with assisted living within this airport environment. Um, but we knew that there's lots of other opportunities out there. And again, uh, going out to IoTAnalytics.com, they've been constantly doing research. 
And this is what they're seeing in the industry, uh, projects by segment, you know, where is GIOT being used? And, and predominantly right now it's in public safety and traffic. There's some, some different projects being used in utilities, lighting, and some other places there, but um, th there's still a lot of opportunities where we can leverage this technology. Um, we seem to be a little bit behind our European counterparts out there, but but the, the Americas, North and South America, we're starting to grab hold of this technology. We're, we're starting to find ways of using this and we're starting to see the benefits. Right? IoT is not going away. It's not just a fad. It's here to stay. We're connected world. We've already determined that. How do we leverage this? And what's interesting, I'm going to kind of pull one of these things out of here. About 2015, the U.S. Department of Transportation uh, created a challenge to all mid-sized cities around the, the nation here. And, and basically what the secretary, um, Anthony Fox, said at the time was transportation is not just about concrete and steel, it's about how people want to live, right? We already seen this in the assisted living facility. We've seen this in the airport facility, but, but the, the, the DOT, the U.S. DOT created, uh, you know, asked the cities, you know, challenged the cities to come back with some ideas. And from that, you know, they, they, they specifically said, we want to see if you can give us some ideas for integrating uh, uh, um, uh, transportation systems that would use data applications and technology to help people and goods move more quickly and cheaply and efficiently around their communities and around their cities. It's a really nice report. If you have some time, um, look it up and read it because it has some really good insight into it. But I wanted, I wanted to pull out of that report some ideas that you might be able to learn from as you start thinking about this technology. So in general, they kind of broke down. There were there were over 150, almost 200 applicants that applied for this, again, mid-sized cities. And I won't read all of these, but I want to point out a couple, like the first one here. It said 44 of the cities proposed projects to test and use of automated shared use vehicles to help travelers connect to their destinations. And if you look at each one of these, each one of these has a geo IoT component attached to it. Every one of them, from a connected to come from, from a connectivity standpoint to gathering data and using that data to help improve the experience of those in their community. The other one I'll point out here is over to the right: how we grow opportunity. So, out of the 100 plus applicants, there were seven that made the finalist list. And so here it says nine cities propose providing free public Wi-Fi on buses, taxis, and public spaces. So to us, having Wi-Fi capability accessible to anybody and, and everybody opens up the doors for a lot of different applications. You saw in the case of the Atlanta airport where we, where we used Wi-Fi in order to track patterns and behaviors of the guests that come to the airport. Well, if we expose that to everywhere, we can use Wi-Fi to, to, to gain a better experience for those who actually use that technology within that area. So you can see some of the other examples here where, where, where cities are, are challenged and are looking for ways to solve problems in these areas. I want to pull out two cities in particular and show you what, what they're thinking and what they're looking at. So the first one here is Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, and um, I apologize if anybody's here from Pittsburgh, I'm not trying to, 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 to um, pull you out here, but it, they do have one of the highest air, uh, air pollutions in the country. And, and one of their challenges is that, that they wanted to solve is to jumpstart an electric conversion process to reduce transportation emissions by 50%. And the way they thought they could do this is by converting up to 40,000 streetlights to LED, smart LED lighting, which would help reduce energy, but it would also establish a smart street light network with sensors that monitor local air quality, so environmental monitoring, install electric cars, convert cities uh, public fleet to electric. So again, this just screams GeoIoT, this screams the Internet of Things, sensor-based technology that allows us to reduce loss and, 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 and cost, right? Remember what Kevin Ashton said 20 years ago. This is where IoT is going. This is how we can leverage IoT is to, is to solve problems and challenges just like this. One more. The city of, of Kansas had a simple challenge. They just lack basic data, access to that data and, and uh, sharing and collaboration of that information. And so they wanted to be able to collect and analyze data on things like tra uh, travel flows and traffic crashes and energy uses and air pollution. The same kind of things that require 
the Internet of Things, the geospatial component of these objects, these sensors that are collecting information, sending information, and reacting on that information. And they wanted to make this data available through open data architecture, right? Those platforms exist. If, uh, if any of you out there are, are an Esri user and a leveraged Esri platform, you know that they have an open data standard already built into that platform. So what I learned from this report was that these cities out there that are that are challenged with some of these uh, these issues are looking for and through the the geo IoT technology to solve these problems. Okay. What other use cases are out there? So through our time here over the last uh, probably about eight years or so now, as we've been getting into this this space, we've been seeing a lot of use cases come to the forefront here. From a GIOT's perspective, a term you might also hear is real-time location services, okay? Things like the analytics, we, we saw some of that in the Atlanta airport there, but we can analyze the movement and behavior patterns of things that we're tracking. We can then obviously monitor and track all of our assets. From a transportation standpoint, we can look at bridge integrity. This is a big discussion around uh, getting high ratings and improving the ratings on our bridge infrastructure. Uh, looking at things that measure stress and gravity and linear. These are all sensor-based technology. These are things that devices that have to be installed, collect data, and send that data someplace else. We can use this data then to enhance our risk management practices. We can look at our environmental mon monitoring, fleet management, flood prediction, predictive analytics, look at all of our different road conditions, situational awareness, space management. You can read the list here. Every one of these use cases requires that technology, the technology of an object or a sensor collecting data and sending that down to something else so that we can use that, we can analyze it, we can display that information, we can probably throw that into our machine learning or our, our, our advanced learning uh, uh, techniques to help us do predictive analysis over the information that we're, that we're gathering. But one thing I want to point out here is as you read through this list of use cases, you know, there's obviously a lot more out there that we can probably think of and talk about. But think of this not from a, an outdoors only perspective. Think of it from an indoors perspective as well. All right, we've, we've over the years, through, through this thing called geographic information systems, we've proven the ability to collect and analyze data outside. But now, we're, now that, that technology is moving indoors, and can we use that same understanding that we've learned outdoors and bring it indoors? And, and, and we're here to say, yes, we can. We, can. we can track and monitor everything indoors as we can outdoors, and we should be doing that. So how do we get started? You know, how, how do we how do we start leveraging this technology, and um, and, and 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 figure out where to put this in place to give us the biggest impact, so we can answer some of the challenges that we have in our our organizations. So uh, here's a, a quick list of things that I think where where you would need to begin. At that 48% of the poll who said not, not started yet, still trying to learn this, this technology is, is first off, get an understanding of IoT basics, right? You're starting that right now. You're starting this webinar series, which is gonna walk you through the basics of IoT and Geo-IoT and how we can use this technology. And through our webinar series, we're gonna dive deeper into sensors and devices. It's it's it's. It's, it's a good idea to understand the different types of sensors and devices and how they communicate through the connectivity protocols out there. So get an understanding. Let's learn about the sensors and devices. Let's talk about the connectivity. Let's talk about once we get data, how do we process that information? And then how do we provide that information back to our users so they can, they can have a better experience? And all along here, let's, let's don't discount the need for security. Right, we need to be able to secure these devices, secure the information as it's being transmitted to some other device, secure the information as we're sharing it back out to others. Right, so this is this is where where I think we should begin. Understand, talk about sensors, talk about connectivity, data processing, and user experience. And whenever we go into a customer who's asking questions or wanting better understanding, we basically ask these six questions here, and we help guide 
the discussion through things like what are you wanting to monitor? Is there is there a wayfinding or navigation required? Do I have to provide a blue dot of my position in this process? What level of positional accuracy do I need? Do I need something that's 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 finite, right down to the foot level? Or can I have something relative accuracy? Right? These things de determine on what kind of sensor and what kind of connectivity I have to have. How often do I need that signal? Or how often do I need to collect that information from these things, from these objects? What can my community or city or facility or building support right now? You know, what what technology can I support right now? Or what do I have to to put in place in order to to use this technology going forward? And and then most importantly, what security does your organization require? And what security should we put in place as we implement this technology? Um, so, so think of these questions as you're looking at the Internet of Things, and and help help optimize your approach into this technology through mitigating uh, your your challenges. Just just and what I caution from is people just going out and and buying something because it looks shiny on the web. If you again, if you search for Internet of Things or sensors or or any one of those kind of combinations, you're going to see a lot of startup companies. You're going to see a lot of devices out there. Take your time and look through this and sift through that. Or call me or email me and let me help you uh, sift through the noise. We've been doing this for a long time, and we've we've found a a nice sweet spot on on the technology and and what we use and what we recommend for our customers. And we're going to have a, a series, a webinar series, just on that topic alone, right? Who's out there in the market? What technology do they offer and provide? And how, how, how can you leverage that? We have a demo center set up in our Birmingham office that where we test out these different technologies. We test out all the different types of sensors. And we, we have gone through this process. We've gone through the growing pains. We've skinned our knees a few times. We can help you answer these questions. But what I what I do recommend is that as you as you start this process, is you don't look at GIT as just a project. Right, this is not a fad. This is not going away. The name may change. Right, the Internet of Things. That name may change. Right, the fact that Internet's in there at all that kind of is, is misleading because there's lots of different types of protocols that communicate information over these objects. So the name may change, but the concept is not going away. We live in a connected world. We need to use these devices and objects moving forward. So I would recommend that you look at GRT as a program. This needs to be part of your your daily discussions, your budget planning, your yearly planning, your uh, your this needs to be part of your business system, just like you have other business systems in your organization. This needs to be part of that process. Uh, otherwise, it's just going to be a project, and you're not going to be able to leverage and get the, mo the the best benefit from that. You need to be incorporating that into everything you do. Now, I want to give you an example of an organization that, that did just that. So I'm going to switch gears here and talk about the Great Lakes Water Authority. So they, years ago, um, made a decision of, of using GIOT and incorporating that into their daily location technology strategies and they've implemented the the tools that are required to do this and so one of the one of the big challenges that they have is during a, a heavy rain event these treatment facilities just just can't keep up right causing this collection pipes to back up and overflow into the rivers right, this is not a good thing and um, the EPA levies a, a large fine for each reported discharge so you know, they wanted to find a way to help mitigate this 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 problem, this challenge, and help help uh, predict and or uh, uh, create alarms and and warnings of when this may occur, so they can take action against that. So what they did is they started implementing these sensors, 68 outfall sensors, 13 level sensors, 36 precipitation sensors. You can kind of see through the different uh, sensors that they, they put out there, things that measure the surge level. And so as rain occurs, these sensors are picking up and reading environmental information, right? The rainfall, the collection basins, the outfall, the levels, and, and, and reporting that back in real time through dashboards and through uh, other, other business systems that gave Great Lakes Water Authority a 
a quicker um, understanding and insight into the conditions of their drainage system before they had issues, and then they could react to them. Right? We're seeing this kind of use throughout many different industries, from, from simply putting sensors on trash containers. So instead of sending someone out in my city and, and driving around looking at trash containers to see if they need to be emptied, that trash container can tell me when I'm 80% full and then send a work order to my work order management system to assign someone to come empty this particular container instead of sending someone out a crew uh, without knowing, right? Be more efficient, you know, reducing, again, what Kevin Ashton said 20 years ago, reducing cost and loss and improving our revenue. Right? Sensors can do that. Looking at catch basins, looking at stream flows, there's, there's lots of different ways that we can use sensors to help mitigate um, uh, the risk within our communities, outdoors and indoors. Same thing with space management, putting these sensors inside our buildings to, to recognize when they're used and when they're not used, turning on lights, turning off lights, reducing energy costs, lowering heat costs and, and air conditioning costs. Sensors can be used just about everywhere. They're not going away. Let me kind of kind of close up this, this presentation and give you some ideas of where other folks are using this technology right now. So we'll kind of go through some of these slides. Uh, in the retail space, we're, we're seeing this all over the place. And you might have already experienced some of these examples. Target is a big one. If you've gone into a Target lately, there's a, you can actually now download a Target app. You can put your iPhone or iPad on your cart. You can create your list, your shopping list, and as you enter the front door, it says, hey, Steve, welcome back to Target. Uh, here's a coupon uh, for a free Starbucks coffee. Get a coffee while you shop. And then as you're shopping, if you get to an item that's not there, instead of you trying to find someone, you just hit a help button. Someone comes find you because they know where you're at. They can assist you. They can. They, you can. You can get a better experience in these retail places, right? Long gone are the days where I write down my my list. I clip out my coupons. These coupons are pushed to me, or I can interact with folks. So there's lots of value that we as individuals find uh, and, and can experience using this technology, as well as the industry itself, and helping you know promote their their business and, and provide automation to their supply chain and, so, and improve their security and, and track and manage equipment. You can kind of see the list here. But this is being used all over in the retail space. And, and likely so, then, the restaurant industry is the same thing. Um, you, can, you can see this in a lot of restaurants. I, I, I visited a Panera Bread one, one time, and, and basically I walked up. I did my order, grabbed this little puck, I sat down to my table, and I realized that that puck had an RFID tag associated with it, and it sent a signal from the table that I was sitting to to that person who was going to serve me my, my food. So they knew exactly where I was at, and, I've already, and I paid via my phone. And so it, it became a better experience for me. I didn't have to wait in a long line. I could go get my seat. We're seeing this all over the place in different restaurant spaces. Um, we talked about the hu health and human services. We're seeing this big time in hospitals and assisted living facilities and uh, urgent care places where we're managing these resident care schedules. We're looking and maintaining inventory and monitoring these risks. Right, there's lots of opportunity here. And again, this is this is if, if anything else, this is th this right here is the why that GI think is in this field. Is, is we definitely see the power and potential of changing lives here. Uh, we also see this in smart spaces, whether it's facility management, universities, campuses, um, health, uh, health campuses, right, hospital campuses, those kinds of things, from finding smart par uh, parking to reserving and, and uh, receiving notifications, to reporting suspicious activity, to triggering those work orders. Or we talked about that before as letting the sensors work smarter for us. Right, adjusting heat and AC and those and those internal environmental conditions based on the occupancy of those spaces, right? All of those uh, become very real, um, and 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 we can use technology within that space, as well as um, asset tracking, right? Both indoors and outdoors, and and what we're seeing here in sort of a fleet management perspective is not only can we um, um, do asset tracking from a vehicle standpoint, but we can do that from hardware or personnel or, or equipment, and we can tie this to other business systems. So here, this is an example of snowplow monitoring, keeping track of 
our AVL, right? We're, 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 we're doing this already, but now tying that also to maybe a complaint system that, that can show me in real time the complaints also in line with the snow plowing. So incorporating couple technologies to bring back a common operating picture or a, 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 an awareness of what's happening within this space. So what else, right? I, I, I started off with this a few slides back of showing where we've seen some use cases, but what are you thinking about, right? What are some of the things that, that, that you might see this technology being used in? We, we encourage you to give us some feedback. You know, where else can, can we use this technology? We, we definitely don't have the market on everything, but we're definitely getting a good sense. And so we'd like to, we'd like to hear from you. We'd like to see, uh, hear your ideas and where you might want to use this within your, your space. We've gotten a lot of really good ideas from our, our customers and clients that have helped steer us in the direction of using sensor-based technology uh, to, to improve the way we work in our facilities and the way we serve our constituents, right? Making that smart city or that smart community. So in closing, I wanted to kind of just uh, um, uh, thank you all for coming. There's, there's been a lot of information that we talked about. We sort of defined IoT as objects communicating with objects. Uh, and that information uh, allowing us to react based on conditions that those sensors are picking up. We define GeoIoT, which brings that spatial element, that spatial component to the mix. It gives us the ability to do proximity and spatial analytics. Uh, we looked at um, some real use cases of um, sensor-based technology and where, where we as a nation are trying to look and solve our, our problems and challenges with this technology. And, and some are, are doing um, um, really good jobs at that right now, but there's a lot of opportunity for us to to continue this 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 evolution of using this technology to to improve our way of life and to to work smarter within our communities. Um, I think uh, what I'll do is um, uh, bring up this last slide right here and uh, and remind you guys of the uh, webinar series and the topics we're going to talk about. But we're going to get into the different sensors and talk a little bit about that, the, the, the different types of ways we can do that through asset tracking, through our positioning systems, our ecosystem with those who, you know, who we work with, and then the future of IoT. Um, there's the URL out there. Uh, please sign up. I, I encourage you to, uh, to share this information with others. And if you want, um, send me any kind of questions or, or comments. If you want to follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter, I, I post uh, videos and white papers uh, periodically about this technology. And at this point, Shannon, I'd like to um, uh, see if there's any questions out there, any final remarks from, from, uh, from you and or, and or others. Yeah, yeah. Um, just a few questions. Um, there was one about a use case. Uh, this person said, I have an office space where I want to track efficiency. How could GeoIoT help? Perfect example. So there's several ways and several technologies. Right? We saw from the Atlanta airport where we're looking at Wi-Fi, anonymous Wi-Fi tracking. Um, yeah, we could use technologies like that. We could use technologies like RFID. We could use Bluetooth. Uh, we could use um, smart LED lighting. But basically, the, the bottom line is we need to track the occupancy. You know, who's using that facility, right? In, in, in old days, you'd have a motion detector sitting on the, the light switch. When someone come in, right, the, the motion would turn the light on. Or if, it was, if, if, if everybody was still in that room, the, the lights would turn off. But long gone are those days, right? You put a simple, a simple sensor in there. Now we can detect live bodies in that space. And if you want to detect how many live bodies in that space, well, then you just, you know, use one of those technologies, either Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or VLC, or the smart LED lighting. And you can actually get to the number of, of folks that use these spaces. Um, in, a, in our next uh, uh, webinar series, I'll show you how we use this within the Birmingham office, in our, in our corporate office, and at, at GIS Inc., we use this to manage how we're using our conference rooms and how we're using, using our space within, uh, within our, our building there. All right, next question. How is Esri's platform IoT ready? The um, the RGS platform is 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 actually better than ever right now. This is this is the perfect time to leverage the platform. 
So the platform comes with a, a, a tool called GeoEvent Server. This is a, a new server role introduced at, at 10.5, which is the entry point in for all this technology. So GeoEvent allows us to ingest this data coming in from these different sensors and then allows us to store that data, retrieve it, analyze it, and display that. Uh, and when we, we, when we talk about our partner ecosystem, we'll get more involved and talk about the details of the platform and how you can leverage the platform. And we'll also introduce this thing called a GeoIoT bridge, where, where, where us at GIS Inc. over the years have learned our, our have, have learned about these different technologies and have built a bridge between the many different sensors out there and be able to plug that right into the platform through the GeoVent server. All right, next, um, we believe we have a good start on IoT initiatives, but how um, do you propose a company get started with GeoIoT initiatives? So I would review your current initiatives and see where the spatial element overlaps, and then also take the ideas that we just talked about today from, uh, from an indoors perspective and an outdoors perspective, and look at ways that uh, that uh, that uh, ge that geography can play a role in any initiative, whether it's um, in your utility space, whether it's in your um, uh, indoors facility space, monitoring the location of things, assets, people. Um, we have a lot of folks using this for when they're doing project work to to monitor their contractors as they, as they come into a space and the equipment that they use and monitor the tools and equipment so they don't walk off the the uh, the, the spaces there. So there's lots of ways that we can we can ingest or interject the spatial component to your initiatives. There was one question that just came in about drones. Um, how drones. Um, play in this space? So drones have a unique capability and provide a unique perspective into the Internet of Things, right? Think of a drone as nothing more than another thing, right? But this thing can be used differently to collect um, um, a to collect video or pictures that can be used to then provide more or additional analytics. I didn't talk about video in this presentation, but video is is starting to become a very um, powerful tool in analyzing um, trends, patterns, assets, and things like that uh, within your organization. So I see drones as a as another component to collecting information and seeing that information to another object that allows us to analyze. So it just becomes another another device, another object that we can leverage for sure. Yep, um, and that's it for questions for this episode. Um, you know, as Steve mentioned, our next webinar will be Thursday, August 16th, um, 11 a.m. Central, and that's titled Work Smarter with GeoIoT. We'll have a special guest from CityWorks. Um, as a reminder, you must register for each of these webinars individually. Um, please uh, go to the link that we've shared. It'll also be in our follow-up email. Uh, if you happen to be going to the Ezra User Conference um, in a couple weeks this July, we welcome you to come by our booth 719. Um, you can have a chat with Steve there, meet him in person, um, have a live demo, conversation, um, and ask any additional questions about uh, GIS Inc.'s GeoIoT solutions. Um, within the next week, you'll receive an email um, with the webinar recording if you happen to join late in the episode. Um, you'll be able to see it in its entirety, um, as well as forward it to any of your colleagues that weren't able to join today. Um, and just as a final reminder, there'll be a few short survey questions that'll come up on the screen once I finish speaking. We greatly appreciate you taking the time to answer them. Thank you so much for joining us, and please have a great rest of your day.